What's up, everybody? This is So Says Jay. Welcome to the Aussie Suns podcast. Top three podcast out there in Suns Nation. Absolutely. Tune in, subscribe, do whatever you do. <laughs> As Chris Paul gets in, another wide open three. Suns. Pierre Cardin. Suns. The first to Booker for the long range jump. Uh, welcome, Aussie Suns fans, to another week of the pod. You might notice something's a little bit different this week. Gav is not with us. He's been very nice to his wife tonight. It's her birthday. So I'm going to take the reins and hopefully do it a little bit of justice. And at the same time, hopefully change things up enough that it upsets Gav when he listens to this. With us tonight, as Boyd, Ballbag, you're back with us. You took a week off with me last week. Thank you for coming back. And no problem, man. a guest that uh, had rave reviews in the chat last week, Trev. Thank you for coming back on, brother. Pleasure, Nate. It's, uh, yeah, gone from clearing waivers to, you know, getting a, a role rotation. It's very nice. Well, me, me and Boyd <laughs> were a little worried we were going to lose our spot last week. Everyone seemed to like Hang your on. show. No. You're put on the show better. <laughs> no, because, oh, hey, you're, um, you actually have, you actually add some value to this thing by doing all the ad- editing. I'm just a fucking, a pretty face and fuck, that's fading as well, mate. So, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> it's Trent, all about perspective, I, Trent, mate. I was I was really impressed with you, Trevor. That was um, it had me worried. <laughs> it, really, it really did. <laughs> appreciate the appreciate the kind words, but no, always pleasure to talk sun soups, boys. So uh, happy to be back. Well, let's get straight into that. Uh, Gab always liked to do a recap, so we will we'll get into that. Uh, we had four games uh, at Orlando, which we picked up the W one hundred two ninety nine back to back. Then with Miami in Miami on the road, we uh, picked up one hundred eleven ninety W. Then off to Toronto for a five-point loss. Oh, sorry, back home against Toronto. And then today's whopping victory, 140 to 111 for the W. So we went three and one on the week. Now, without going through, let's do a full recap, looking at all the stats, looking at the players of the game, defensive player of the week. Let's just have a bit of a conversation around who our standout players were to us and what moments we saw through the week that we wanted to actually chat about uh, that were on our minds. So why don't you start us off there, Trev? Yeah, sure thing. Look, for mine, the standout moment of the week was probably a period of play in the Miami game. Uh, for all of us that were watching, they came out and were just knocking down everything. Robinson was just Steph Curry on in fuego mode. And I'm thinking this is going to be a repeat from what we saw earlier in the season. But Consider that Miami had 25 on the board and there was six minutes and change left in that first quarter and they only scored two more points for the rest of that quarter. And then we just produced a defensive masterclass the rest of the way. So that for me was huge. I mean, I had that game circled on the calendar for a long time, you Mm -hmm. know, wanting revenge on what happened. Um, So that was big. But in terms of players of the week, there were two, I thought DA's work on the glass, you know, got straight to work on in the Orlando game, you know, after being asked the question, rightfully so, against a, a poor effort against Miami. Ah, oh, sorry, poor effort against the Bucks on the boards. Uh, and campaigns week as well, I thought was sensational. 37 assists to eight turnovers. Mm-hmm. And the game just it, it's, looks like it's just coming to him now. It's slowed down a bit for him instead of being that chaotic can that we have seen at times where we coughs it up. And I really think it's he's going to be a great asset to have. I was a bit worried how we we're going to go from playoff time to have him clearly comfortable running the offense. It's going to be huge um, to be able to create something with that bench unit. Well put. Boy, do you want to jump in now? Yeah, so um, um, Orlando was, was was a gimme, guys. We should have um, – we're always going to tear them guys up. But, um, yeah, that, that Miami game was a standout for me. Um, uh, look, that's the scrappiest uh, – uh, the scrappiest, probably the best defensive team that we're going to – come up against you've got the likes I mean you've got these guys who have just have made their careers on just being pests and just real hard-nosed defenders your Cole Lowry's your PJ Tucker's your Jimmy Butler's right so there's a three-headed defensive hydra right there man so yeah we did um we did really good there but you know usually usually when you when you have you know when you're putting so much um so much um um emphasis on defense your yeah, offense can slip but we we had the best of both worlds that uh, that night, and then we, um, yeah, that was really really impressive basketball. And just as uh, Trev was saying, like that 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 first quarter, man, 
I thought that them two fucking um, white spastics that I think I called them last time. I thought I thought that they were I thought they were going to drop a fucking fifty piece one of them. So um, <laughs> they were fucking lighting it up from three. So um, yeah, the fact that we uh, that, that you know we adjusted and, um, and and shut them guys down was 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 really was really good coaching and and play from the boys. But um, yeah, so then it was obviously the. The loss against Toronto, and 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 I'll say the same thing on that as I did um, last time that we played them. Like they're they're a long team, they're a long team, they're athletic, and and it's they're just they would just be super awkward to um, play against. I think I don't think that they're the most talented squad, but they they definitely bring something that not many other teams do, and I think it just sort of just app yeah, just upset the apple cart a bit. Well, um, they are one of the teams that. No, every week when we do this, you usually shit on any of us thinking that we're going to get uh, some competition out of these teams. But Toronto seems to be one that you've never actually said we're full of shit. You've agreed that, you know, they've they've got it together. They're playing well. They're probably going to put it to us in ways we're not used to winning. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a real test. It's a real test. Like I said, it's just, um, yeah, they're just really, as a team, they're, they're just hard to match up against, I guess. Um, but, yeah, look, I... And when you look at Toronto, is there anyone on that team that you think, mm, I'm fucking scared of him? But there's not, like, Pascal Siakam isn't who he used to be, I think, when, when, when he was at the, at the um, peak of his career. Um, and just there's just no one that really jumps out at you and that you think, fuck, he's going to be, ew, he's going to be a handful. But I think just collectively, they're just um, something different that not many other teams have. In the league with their, um, you know, with their with their length in particular. Well, um, I think they're getting there. That's Scotty Barnes oh, is a very exciting rookie. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, he is. He is. But he's a fucking rookie, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not. I'm. I'm not worried about you know players like Josh Giddy. I'm not worried about fucking Cade Cunningham. But I think um, that team as a collective just bothers me. Like, and and, and I look at. You know, the play, reason play, you're not worried about him is because those two players you mentioned are on shit teams. <laughs> you know, yeah, true, Scotty true. Barnes is on a team with a hope. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a hope, but anyway, yeah, they're just awkward. They're very awkward. It's really hard to explain. I'm, 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 I'm not a great basketball mind, so I can't really, I can't really pick it. But um, and I think that uh, the fourth game being Lakers, man. <laughs> Man, you, you you love to see it, don't you? I just, um, yeah. And, well, yeah. One, one of those stats I points. saw from today on the Lakers game um, was every starter from the Lakers, so what they have, um, LeBron, Stanley Johnson, Le, 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 Malik Monk, Austin Reeves and Westbrook, all shot exactly 50% for the field goals. All of them shot 50% for the game. The whole starting five. And it was also, I believe, the most points the Lakers have ever given up in a first quarter uh, in the shot clock. 48. Yep. So that's, uh, what, that's a beautiful little before? thing to have in the books. So. Isn't it? The, the other stat on that one too cups. was, um, what was it, ESPN Stats and Info on Twitter, I read it. Um, 48 points in the first quarter, which is what we scored, is the second most in Suns history. So it's always, it's always nice to get that sort of thing against the Lakers. Yeah, oh, it wasn't like we were raining three balls either. Like we put up one forty, and I think we made—is it fourteen threes or twelve threes? So, like, it wasn't a silly, you know, dropping 20, 23 point bombs. We were just scoring in a myriad of ways, and as we know, it's not like we were escorted to the foul line too often either. We were just moving it around. I think yeah. thirty-two assists. So, pretty stuff. And funny, funny thing on that. I think the first quarter we were six from ten from. From deep, so the fact that we didn't go on and and get and and drop twenty odd threes in that game is probably um is probably a, a bit of a shock because we we're, we're firing absolutely yeah. hot from three to start anyway. But some of those open looks the book got early. Good lord, I it think like, oh, don't man. you know who this man is? <laughs> it's just we we were like open. That. These these guys are so discombobulated is mm. is, is a word I think, but that was. Defensively, they were just, it's like they Boris. just don't fucking yeah. talk. I mean, LeBron staying back, I think Stafford said in the chat, you know, um, um, the, the commentators had a, a bit of a bit of a chat about LeBron 
um, not getting back on defense, staying at it's like cherry picking down the other end of the court. Yeah. I mean, it's just absolutely like there's. That's there's good a, to hear, isn't it? It's good to hear the man, commentators the actually culture, saying that about LeBron. Yeah, and the culture there must be must be so fucking terrible. I mean, they've got you know some people call him the goat, and 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 he can't he he can't get these guys together. And but he asked for it, right? LeBron is a guy that he he likes to get his guys. And um, it, regardless of whether they're injury prone or what, if if he wants it, he generally gets it. And then the clubs that that he plays for are in these precarious um, positions where they have to fucking um, get minimum contracts. Of, mm-hmm. I don't think many. I don't think many many um, minimum guys want to come like good guys or good guys on the MLE really want to come and play with LeBron James because they know well, not that after he's this gonna, season. Well, yeah. I think it's been I think it's been something that that's been trending because ultimately, you want to if you're a minimum guy or or, or you're trying to you know uh, pave your way in the league and get yourself a decent contract, you you, you know LeBron James is going to feed your top top three guys, right? He's, he mm-hmm. he racks up assists and he'll look after AD and he'll look after Camelo to a certain extent, and um and Russ Brooks is going to take whatever the fuck he wants. But um, you He's being a, a holiday player, soon. <laughs> why would why would a player um like Jay Crowder want to go there and um and and just have his value diminished by and watered down just by playing with a guy that is just so fucking you know one track mind minded and has his guys and that's it sort of thing. So I don't think it's become I think it's becoming less and less of a destination the longer that LeBron James is there. I, I think it's safe to say the Lakers experiment is over. We spoke about um, last Sunday, I think, that LeBron, since he came onto the Lakers, has literally turned the entire team over but himself. There no one from yes. no one from the roster before LeBron got there is still in the Lakers. And like you just said, everyone that's gone there, all their, their value has been diminished. Russell Westbrook is a joke now because of the way, uh, being on the Lakers. He was still he was still valued in Washington. But, but yeah, now... yeah. But you 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 look at um, Montrez Harrell. Um, and mm. and and the likes of Kuzma, they've gone, they've somewhat thrived in Washington. Mm. And these are guys that that well, I mean, um, Kuzma was drafted, of course, but Montrez went there on an MLE, I believe, or something around there. Um, and he's got fucked, man. <laughs> he just got fucked over. It's like there yeah. was there was there was no way he was going to be able to build up his value with um with what LeBron could get him on on the court. But then he goes and you know he. He's playing some brilliant basketball over at over at the the Wizards. So um, good on him. And um, I think I think that was a lesson learned for a lot of other guys in this coming up free agency that will probably think twice. So all I really uh, wanted to talk about on here was a standout player of the week for me was Devin Booker, and not for the right reasons. A couple of weeks ago, we were talking about um, Crowder and his turnovers that cost us that game. And then oh, against Utah, owned, yeah. Yeah, and then he owned it, and he turned around, and then it was actually in the um, Toronto game where Crowder did not repeat the mistake, and he was in <laughs> similar situations, and he made the right play, and we got back in it, and then the next four turnovers that just came out of nowhere and cost us the game, I think Booker was responsible for two of them, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, and Booker literally had to own the fact that he lost us that game, but then turned around in the Lakers game today and just took it back. Yeah, you know, he didn't with that bounce back effect where he came back and again it's good to see the guys that when they're making these mistakes they are learning from them and choosing not to repeat them. Um, I just think it was week after week to see Crowder and Booker be in exactly the same situation and then Crowder not repeat it and Booker actually uh, repeat it. Uh, I was chatting to Mick, one of the members of our group, that's uh, I'm mates with up here in. He seems to call it the the CP3 calming effect. Uh, when you get late in these games, oh, yes. his presence on that court slows everything down, and everyone is more confident when he's out there. And that's uh, possibly causing some of these turnovers. Well, look, Booker was getting double teamed like ferociously in that in that fourth quarter, right? And he um and look, he 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 will generally get rid of the ball, you know, um, before he's trapped or is forced out of bounds or forced to make a really, really tough pass or shot. But um yeah, he um he, he tried to take on too much in them in them I think it was two out of that them last four turnovers were literally yeah. they trapped him um high 
and then he just but he wanted the shot the... too. He wanted to take. Of the course shot. he did. So of, of course he did. But you he know, wasn't a, without CP, blame. A, C, a, a CP three in that same situation is a lot a lot calmer, and he's gonna he's gonna get that extra pass or get it to someone he knows who can um, um, get get a better pass away. So I just feel like that little bit of experience. You're exactly right. Whilst campaign has been fucking brilliant in, in, in distributing the ball and setting guys up. He's taken a little leaf out of, out of CP3's book. The game management side is where um, um, campaign still isn't quite there. Um, but, yeah, look, I I 100% agree, man. Like, them crunch crunch minutes um, um, without CP3 are different. Um, but I think um, considering, you know... Um, Hey, considering the that, end of the week what was it three wins and a loss that's still a bloody good week yeah exactly yeah. so yeah and we're, and and think, we're missing sorry, go on. yeah no no, no you gonna, oh sorry boy no i was gonna say look and don't underestimate the effect of not having cam johnson out there as well just that additional yeah. spacing you know it's a lot easier to find a guy popping out out to the top of the key rather than you know trying to create something inside in traffic so and that was you know i'm glad you, you brought up about book and even saw it today um you know, that blitzing that they like to do, mm. which I think you'll see a, a bit of it happening. And I think it was when Holiday was running the point. And I noticed that Monty brought in campaign pretty much straight away. I think they might have tried it two possessions in a row, the Lakers, and they brought him in. So I think that's a, a big aspect as well. But yeah, these are all learning experiences. I mean, everything that's happening now, I mean, look, there's certain games that you want to win for sure. Uh, but then I'm all for teaching, you know, now you know, getting ready for those playoffs. We've seen Monty, you know, throw a couple of wrinkles in. He's, I think he ran Busy and Javel. It might have been against Miami or maybe Orlando um, uh, just that, for a period. That, that was against the loss, actually. That was Toronto when they had to bring oh, two bigs sorry. in to counteract yes, the, um, the Toronto. Yeah. So sure. I'm happy that he's trying these things because this is what you want to see mm. rather than just running them up. But um, And yeah, you can't complain it's... if they're doing a learning curve in a 29-point win game either. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. So, um, you know, that's the best time to do it. So it's cool. good. Fellas, we spent, uh, what, just over 15 minutes now talking about the past. Let's put it in the past and talk about what's to come. All right, so we're going to look at the week ahead. Again, going to do this a little bit differently. Um, we're just going to assume this week we're going all Ws, right? We're going to go full Boyd. Uh, let's not look at wins or losses. Let's just have a look at the games and uh, have a chat about the ones that we particularly want to talk about. The matchups that get us or what, what's going on in our week. Uh, so we've got to Wednesday at uh, New Orleans. Thursday at Houston. Saturday versus Chicago, so at home. And then Monday back on the road in SAC. So we've got a four, game, uh, four games this week. One at home, and that's the Chicago game. Uh, Trev, what one are you most looking forward to? What do you want to talk about? I was probably look most looking forward to the Pelicans game, you know, a bit of revenge from a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's lost some of its luster. Looks like Ingram and CJ are going to miss. But what I want to say... Oh, really? Yeah, I think Ingram's still there with that hamstring and, and CJ's in the health and safety protocol. So it's taken um, a bit of the gloss off it. But having said that, it'll still be my game of the week that I want to see. I want to see DA acquit himself strongly on those boards against big Jonas Valanciunas. He's an, probably behind Stephen Adams. He's probably the second strongest bloke out there. I guess you could, you could throw Embiid in there as well. But he's a monster on the boards, right? Now, that doesn't funny mean they got to... traded for each other, right? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Now, that doesn't mean I need to see DA grab 20 rebounds, uh, you know, to fortify that. I need to see him work to box Valanciunas out, you know, and if someone else comes in from the weak side and grabs the board, that's cool. But these are the things that I want to see. I mean, looking at the standings now, there is a, a chance. I mean, with the way the Lakers are, the Pals, you, I'd probably be backing them to beat the Lakers in the plane, you know, so they'll have a chance to yeah. potentially get to that eighth spot. So it could potentially be a first round matchup. And I think that would be the key. Um, you know, the Pals look good. After the, mm. the, the, the mid-season trade with uh, you know, CJ McCullum and Ingram coming along and... Like you said, Valanciunas, where he sits as a big man, if they bring Zion back and the guy can actually jump on that ankle. I mean, yeah, and uh, they, one, they guy that's really, one guy that's really being slept on in terms of rookies, I think is Herb Jones for the Pels. He yeah. is a phenomenal defender. Um, some of the work that I've seen from him, it's an amazing body of work. And particularly on a team that's been struggling, 
I think that's always worth more, particularly on the defensive end. So, um, yeah, very keen to buy everyone's stock on her. Big fan of him. But, yeah, that's yeah, his, the game I'm his, looking for. His name is popping up everywhere in podcasts. Like, yeah. People are noticing. So I think, yeah, now he's starting to get a bit of a bit of respect, which is good. Um, Houston, I think, will be a, a tricky game. You know, again, it's one of those trap ones where it doesn't matter if you win by 25 points or whatever, it's Houston. I think Chicago will be a close game, but I think we'll execute better in the clutch. So I wouldn't, I think it'll be a narrow victory, maybe two possession, one possession game. Um, and then Sacktown, look, I guess we're getting a different look at them, right? Um, once we get there, but, you know, I'd still be relatively <laughs> confident. We take, um, you know, we, we at least go 3 1 for the week. So if we take that, I'm pretty happy. Boyd, is there a standout game for you that you want to talk about? I think, um, yeah, I I get what you mean, Trev, about the about the danger game, and I think Houston have been um, um, uh, playing with a bit more vigor of of late. They've uh, had a couple of upsets, and um, they're a young, energetic team, and they just don't fucking stop. So, I think um, to lose and everything to gain, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, these guys are just out there trying to make a name for themselves, and and so look, it could it could pose some problems, but I still think that we're just we are that well-rounded that um, um, we'll be able to overcome it quite easily. Uh, uh, New Orleans would have been, look, I've got CJ in my fantasy and I've had Herb Jones in there as well. And, and uh, I think before he got some, some, some injury, but um, um, he's back now, but yeah, and he was doing really well for me. So yeah, he's, he's one I am very, very much um, watching on the, <laughs> on that, on that game. But um, I think um, Chicago, for me, is going to be the uh, uh, with Big Vooch, Levine, and uh, Demar. I think that's that's obviously the game. The game that I'm not going to get to watch with you boys, um, but uh, yeah. I'll be sneaking looks at, <laughs> at my phone. So that's definitely that is the game for me. Look, and that's the game that we're going to be measured against. We're going to be expected to win these others. That game against Chicago, and that's why it's going to. We need to keep on um, applying pressure. With the foot on the throat and um and and jamming it, jamming it into these fucking national media pricks who keep fucking um <laughs> talking about LeBron James for fucking the first first five minutes of the game and we're the fucking you know we're the bees knees we're the top of the table you know um so I think I think these these national um, um TV games that we get um I I think that they need need to be the ones that we win and win convincingly no fucking garbage time need to put these pricks away like we did the lakers today well you, you you took the words out of my mouth as far as the uh game that i want to watch and that's obviously the chicago game because like you said it's going to be a queensland catch-up again we've got uh what is it stafford and Aaron up from uh perth oh, sorry perth from uh, south australia uh, myself vossi gab's up from um vic so there's going to be a nice little crew we're going to wing house again to watch this game so obviously that's that's going to be the one i'm talking about boy you mentioned it, and we, we spoke and had a bit of a laugh off, off camera before we started recording. Why is it you can't make it again? What, uh, what, what date did you forget? <laughs> so I, um, I, was, uh, I was asking for a leave pass, I will say, from, um, by, uh, from the missus, and um, I mentioned the 19th of March, and uh, she said, oh, on Chuck's birthday, Chuck, the boy that I named after Charles. So um yeah, young uh, Charles Crawley. So he um it's his birthday, it's turning two. So apparently we've got a fucking birthday party and, and and shit to do that day. So and look, basically when I when because I don't fucking remember my kids' birthdays, man. I, I think I know. I was one gonna say, two. mate, you, you you haven't too many of them. If you, I know, you I, know, stop. I know. It's 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 every other fucking month, right? So um yeah. I'm I'm losing my fucking mind. Um, but yeah, look, and when I said, oh, oh, I got this uh, silent, still stare. And I said, oh, no, that's okay, baby. Yeah, no, no, that, that's okay. That's okay. I, so yeah, I've, uh, I've been uh, relegated to uh, home duties when you guys are going to be drinking one litre steins of fucking <laughs> glorious beer. And um, yeah, I'll be... I'll be cleaning up fucking cake off the couch. Don't you, don't you worry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, well, I'm glad I brought that up. I really wanted everyone to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Lifestyles of the rich and famous, mate. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all happening. 
<laughs> All right, well, that's the week past, the week ahead. Now let's just... Uh, I wanted to take this a little bit of a different direction than, and then Gav probably would have and go a little more old school traditional pod. Just hit a couple of discussion points um, and, and thanks for yours as well, boy, that we'll, we'll get on to. Not an argument, just uh, this is what's going on this week. This is some of the things uh, let's give our opinions on. So the first one I wanted to throw out there was when are we going to see a DA 2020 double-double? Now, the, the contents, uh, context of that's obviously he had a good game today. Previously, when he finished with a 22 and 19, um, he hit a, was his first 2020 game in the NBA Finals since it would have been, uh, since Shaquille O'Neal in 2004, if Chris Paul had a, not taken that rebound off him <laughs> in the finals. <laughs> but um, when, given that we've been talking about DA needing to step up and not really living up to expectations um, because we set pretty high expectations for him as fans. Uh, when are we going to see that 2020 game, Drev? Uh, look, I think always games like that are always, you know, victim of circumstances. He had it rolling today. It was a blowout, right? So he sat on the sat on the yep. bench and rightfully so for the last quarter. So things like that always um, come into it. Look, I think sometime in the playoffs is going to be your better bet. You've got you know he's likely to increase the minutes by a bit. And, so, you know, are we going to get on the? Are we going to get on that um, playoff DA thing? Not like the playoff PG, which is <laughs> yeah. the the opposite yeah. of that playoff P. Goodness gracious <laughs> me! Look, I think um, you know his production inside and that that hook that he has, that amazing touch around the rim, right? But there's times where he's got it going, and then he has like one shot for a half kind of thing. So. Mm. The points aspect, I think, sometimes goes on teammates that they don't look for him enough. Because I see, you know, where is he? Where's the big boy? And he's making the same moves as he was earlier in the game when he was getting the ball and scoring. But, you know, they, they tend to go away from that. And the rebounding, there is absolutely no doubt he is a physical specimen that could get 20 boards a game if time allowed him to. And he switched on up here. He's got the athleticism to just, you know, be the big boy on the playground and reach over. Unfortunately, we don't always get that. And I think for mine, the playoff DA kind of falls into that category. It's being switched on, ready to rumble. I noticed today he seemed pretty engaged early doors, which is always a great sign and wasn't surprising because he was rolling. So I do think, and, and this is, I guess, another thing where you miss Chris Paul is he knows to get his guys going early. And I think DA is a big yeah, one. True. Gets him going early, engaged in the game. The rest takes care of itself. Uh, McGee's a little bit similar as well. You know, you like to get him going before he commits a couple of his clumsy fouls that he can rack up in quick time. So I think it's, you know, it's within touching distance. Um, but yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, so play, as play long as we get DA. the Ws, that's what I'll be, that's, <laughs> that's what I'll be happy To your with. point, and we should actually outline, he has actually had one game where it was a 2020 double-double. It was the 16th of January, 2020 um, in New York. He had 26 points and 29 boards. It's the, as far as I can tell, the only time he's done that. There's been several close ones. But to your point, last playoffs, he did have two that were within a board base or within mm. a point. So he had um, 19 points and 22 boards against late, uh, the Clippers. And he had 22 points and 19 boards against Milwaukee. Um, so maybe you've just started a new trending uh, hashtag, playoff DA. <laughs> Trev, <laughs> we'll give you credit if that happens. Switch. <laughs> yeah, so with the whole DA thing, like how how long's a piece of string? I mean, I don't for me as a fan, I don't as long as I'm seeing effort and 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 as you were saying, Trev, as long as he's boxing out and he's getting to the right spots, um, I don't I don't really care when we see another 2020 game. I'd like to see look in the last week, Monty's obviously trying some new things when CP3's out, right? Um, um, he was playing a lot of um, 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 drop defense with um, DA, but then he started, you know, we, we had to adjust because we were getting hammered. I think that Atlanta game when um, when DA was dropping and um, uh, Trey Young went silly. But I think um, I think he's, um, he's he went through a patch where he was switching more and defending on the perimeter. And that was by design and his rebounds dropped off. But then when Monty's um, um, addressed it, um, and 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 DA acknowledged it. He's so the last week, right? The, the four games just passed. He's averaging 
13 boards. He's had a 19 and a 16 board game and a, a 7 and 10 or something like that. But, um, but look, he's, um, he, can, he can consciously um, 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 flip, a, flip a switch and, and get back down to it. But I think at, at the end of the day, look, he's also shot 70% in the last week. 70% on field goals and he's he's thrown up a, shots. He's, he's thrown up a through um a, a few threes and he's um and he's rebounding at at a, at a high rate. So as so long as he keeps it keeps that energy and he and he, and he just he, he keeps that same that you know that same effort level, I don't I really don't mind. Um so long as he's not pulling them them games where he's getting three or six or you know five boards a game. Um yeah, as long as he's um, staying engaged, I think. But yeah, look, if he didn't get a twenty twenty game for the rest of the season, I would not fucking lose a wink of sleep. So long as, so long as we can see he's making the right rotations and he's um, staying engaged with the, with the, with the rest of the team and playing good team defense. Yeah, very cool. Uh, and and let, I remember when he was a rookie, we're all saying he should be an automatic twenty and ten guy. Everyone said it should coming in. And I, I still don't know if we're seeing the, the amount of effort where he is automatic for at least that, let alone 2020. But let's hope that, Trevor, you are right, and it is hashtag playoff DA. All right, let's move on to the second trade bill. Yeah, there you go. You're just <laughs> bait and pending. <laughs> right, some other news this week. Um, probably won't be much of a discussion because I can guarantee you none of us know much about it. Uh, the Suns use their second two-way spot and sign Danish player Gabriel Lundberg from the EuroLeague. He's a six foot four inch, 205 pounds, six foot nine wingspan, 27 year old. Um, according to Woj, he bought out his own contract uh, from CSKA, CSKA of Moscow to basically bail the F out of that country. Uh, and also according to Woj, is considered the best international free agent in the market. Uh, now he's sitting on a two-way slot with us. A couple was it? Oh, no, it might have been uh, Sunday or the week prior. Boy, you and Gav were talking about potential changes to the two-way player rule, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so at, that... at, this, at this point, he cannot play under the current rules in the playoffs. But what were the potential rule changes that you and Gav were talking that may come through, which might allow a two-way player uh, recently signed to play in the playoffs? Well, the the change ultimately would be that. Because of um, all the, you know, the COVID protocols crap, and um, um, that they would allow a or both two-way players to um, um, qualify for, for playoff matches, it'll get it. It hasn't happened, and that's why I wasn't. I wasn't. It's been talked about a fair bit, but it hasn't happened, and it may not happen. And if it doesn't happen, we're going to have a decision to make. Now, there's a there's there's a lot of talk about Lundberg, and. Um, you know, the fact that he is the top European prospect at the moment. He's 27, he's a vet. He, he fits right into what James Jones looks for in a player, whereas a lot of other teams use them spots for, for younger guys. But I think, um, I think I think if we really want him to play playoffs and he, and he impresses in uh, uh, practice and, and look, he could just be there for training purposes to have another body, who knows? But um, if we really do want him, it's, um, it's Elf that'll probably um fall off the roster and if he impresses well then he'll get a start but yeah look it's it's really um we just don't know what's happening with that two-way two-way rule so yeah it's hard it's really it's really hard to say but this guy is apparently he's um he's an athletic he can shoot the ball um and yeah so look i think i think he's exactly what monty looks for in a player looks a little bit like Abdel Nader. Hopefully he doesn't fucking play like him. <laughs> but um, but yeah, look, I think he's um, I think he's I think he's right right in that mold that Monty likes. So um, um, yeah, fingers crossed, man. He's a he's a he's a gem in the, in in the rough or a diamond in the rough, and you know we can keep him around and he and, and it pays off for us in the future. What do you reckon, Trev? What are your thoughts? Look, I think it's it's always an interesting one, right? When you sign. You know, even if it's a two-way contract at this time of the year, um, given the way that you're going. So you kind of look at a, di- a bit deeper and I think Boyd's hit the nail on the head. It probably means Alfred Payton's papers are stamped from that regard. It's going to be hard for him, you would think. I mean, there's not a lot of home games. I think what, we've got four home games left in the season and they're all singles. So the team's going to be 
traveling a little bit um, and he's still a, a little while away from arriving from what I understand. So it's going to be hard for him to, you know, stick his hand up straight away. Mm-hmm. But that being said, they wouldn't just throw the slot away for, for no reason either. So he's obviously got some ability um, and coming in there. So, yeah, I don't know. It's – look, I always – you know, you always want to see guys on your team do well, right? And I thought it was a couple of weeks ago when Peyton knocked down two threes in the one game. I thought, oh, here we go. Um, yeah. but, you know, it was a it was a small sample size, and yeah, it's I don't know. Save just, ass here. <laughs> yeah, and then there were times where you know you just think this guy was starting for the Knicks last year, and he looked really competent running the offense, <laughs> and he gets out there, and you're like. What are you doing, man? You know, it's like he's got that, you know, remember he used to have that ridiculous fade that ran over the top of his... It's like he's got that back, you know, but we can't see it because it looks like he's got the blinkers on. So There's, There I mean, must holidays... be something about that starting point guard position for the Knicks, though, right, that's just poison because every good that's player right. that goes there ends up shit. That's exactly right. And then, you know, I guess you can't help but put up good numbers with Thibs. If you're a starter, Thibs will pay you 44 minutes a night. <laughs> you know, it's not a, even if the bench gets a run, the starters come back in. So, yeah, look, I think it's one to one to watch. And I guess, look, if he does make it, they can always convert that two way to a, a full. Yeah. And, you know, maybe someone like a Wainwright or you'd have to think Peyton maybe gets Elf on the shelf. Move, yes. moved along to um, make room. Well, but, yeah, be, Ish Wainwright's already on a two. He's got the other two ways. So he's yeah. going to find himself not playing playoff basketball unless unless we can create that roster spot as well. So, well, Or they I, change the rule. I must admit, when I saw that that uh, that news that we signed a player that bought himself out of his contract, uh, I, I had a well, chuckle. He's in fucking Moscow. Yeah, he's yeah. He was in Moscow. So he bought his way out of his own contract so he could get the F out of the country. And I just thought, you know, if it's typical James Jones doing something we don't expect, this is what he meant by the buyout market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Playing chess yeah. and everyone's doing checkers. That's right. That's our guy. <laughs> All right. Next discussion point we're going to talk about is Big Busy and the standout human that he is. And the reason this is coming, it's kind of twice now. Um, these, uh, the news this week is that he's donating his 2021-22 salary to the Congo to build a hospital in honor of his dad. Um, and we were talking about it before, Trev, his previous charity, uh, there was an April 2020 where he donated a million dollars to the Congo for PPE because there's no way people wouldn't go to work and not earn a coin in the Congo. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to start again with you, Trev, because you had some um, interesting perspective on. Uh, on Big Busy and what else he does to be... Yeah, what, well... Uh, what, noticed... what was it? What Time magazine called next uh, one of the next generation of leaders? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we're blessed to be in the day and age that, we, that we're in now, you know, with social media, you get access to the interviews. And I'm not sure if everyone out there's had the chance to listen to Busy Talk, but you just can't... Have, he's infectious to listen to, um, you know, where his story, his background. And clearly, you know, he's not just a... Um, a, a rebounding machine. He clearly knows his way around. Hence, he wouldn't have been voted in as a VP for the Players Association. So he's clearly a good guy, someone who's got the players' interests in heart. Um, but I think it's all just testament to, I mean, if this was an Australian team, it, it's the equivalent of a no dickheads policy, right? <laughs> Every guy one through 15 or 16, when you include the two, they're all like stand-up dudes. Sure, you've got, you know... They, a couple of them lose their temper on court, but that's but all off the court. They're you know they're just gems, and they all clearly enjoy each other's company, hanging out with each other, and they all genuinely celebrate each other's success. Um, I could see Book on the bench today had his arm around Busy, and they were talking about something. So obviously, G him up to get into the game. So yeah, I think it's you know a, from a basketball sense, absolutely, it was an astute signing. But he's clearly a, a straight up human, as you said. And, now, as I referenced last week, Cam Johnson's an absolute gem of the human, but this effort from Busy may have put him in the shade, which is, you know, that is uh, a hard thing to do because I think most fathers would want Cam to marry their daughters, I would think. He's a, he's a straight-up guy. So, yeah, all, all effort to Busy. And, to, um, you know, in um, memoriam of his dad, I believe, that the hospital will be um, erected for. So, look, that's a, a long-lasting tribute, and it's clearly someone who's had a huge impact on his career, both on and off the court. So absolute pleasure to have him on our team, but yeah, just a great human and it's a great story. So all, uh, all credit to him. 
What do you feel or, or think when you were hearing about this sort of news about our, our big busy? Yeah, yeah, it's good. I fucking, I don't, I don't feel anything, mate. I don't, um, I don't <laughs> that's, I don't, that's what we expected from you, brother. I, I don't, I don't yeah, remember your kid's I, birthday. Don't, I don't feel that's anything. it. <laughs> I don't, fucking, I don't. I don't, I don't feel anything, but you know, you're right. It's, 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 it's a good look for the team. Um, um, falling in the footsteps of, you know, uh, Dikembe Mutombo did um, a similar, um, similar, really, really, and he's still doing it for the Congo, the Congo fucking um, democratic, whatever the fuck it is. But yeah, um, no, I think it's, oh, I love it. <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. Really, um, really nice that he can give back to you know his home country or whatever. But you know what? It's um, one point three million dollars. Fucking, uh, I think he was he was making sixteen million a year um, a couple of years ago when he signed that um, that big deal. I think it was with the Magic, maybe. But um, yeah, I didn't I didn't see him giving that away. But um, yeah, in, <laughs> it's still it's still one point three million dollars, right? So, so you and me don't have one point. That prick has away. plenty of fucking money. He should have fucking rounded it up to two, is what I'm saying. Well, uh, you've taken that tax too. He, he didn't actually get one point three, <laughs> but anyway. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, yeah. It's um, ultimately, it's um, it's it's. it's a I think you said a, it was a really cool. It was really nice, and you don't feel anything. Yes, That's fantastic, boy. Good on him. Good on the Congo. <laughs> Mate, I'm going to cut you off because I'm going to throw straight back to you. The last discussion point before we get into a very different thumbs up, thumbs down for the week uh, was something to do with the Zach Lowe that you wanted to um, talk yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Zach Lowe and Bill Simmons, uh, well, Bill Simmons jumped on Zach Lowe's podcast and they're talking about, you know, and, and they always, you know, with a, a couple of words to the side, they say, oh, Phoenix is really, really good. But then Zach Lowe goes on to say, Oh, you know what? You know this could look a lot different um, um, next season when you know the likes of uh, um, Denver, fucking um, um, the Clippers are back to full strength. Um, so basically, and and he basically said that them them teams have um, yeah much higher ceiling when their players return, but he feels like the Suns have already um, reached their ceiling. Um, and and I was listening to a couple of pods today, and this has always pissed me off about. Um, it's not the first time that Zach and and Bill have um, have talked down the success of the Phoenix Suns and their fucking ceiling, and the fact the fact that they say, oh yeah, you know, but you know, and they question whether or not we have a second gear or a third gear going in, into playoffs, right, and um, making it to the finals again, and and doing it again next season. And and my thing was in. Um, um, uh, the solar panel had the Fanning the Flames boys on, and mm-hmm. and and um, Dervish of well, uh, Paul. He said, and I completely agree, man. Um, our guys, Cam Johnson, fucking Devin Booker, around 25, 26 years old. Mikael Bridges, Da, they're all. Uh, I think Da is twenty four, maybe. But these guys, and you talk about, um, you know, fucking 10, 15 years ago. Players were hitting their prime when they hit 27. And we've got a large core of guys who are improving every year who are yet to hit that age. That's when they hit their fucking prime. And then it's about a five-year, five to six-year gap where they're at their peak, right? So right from 27 up to about 32 is when they're in their peak. And then you start seeing some sort of plateau and some decline. Now, that's that's 10, 15 years ago talk, right? So nowadays, primes are looking more like 30 and lasting to 35 because of sports science and all the shit that goes into it. But, you know, they oh, well, they're still starting at 27, but they're just going that bit, that bit longer. So my thing is, is that you've got, you've got all these players who are yet to hit the old definition of what, um, you know, someone going in their prime um, is there's yet to hit there, but they're saying that we've already reached our fucking ceiling. Like fucking come on, man. Trev, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw to you because I'm I'm gonna go full Boyd and just start swearing uh, in response to the the discussion point. <laughs> so if you want to oh, keep it kid friendly for a few minutes, <laughs> yeah, look by all means. I think you know that's the the thing with your social medias as well. You know, too many people have access to it and can put out whatever they like, which is sometimes good. You get some funny stuff, and then you just get some downright bizarre stuff. And then I saw. A latest might have been Bleacher Report, but I stand to be corrected. That had the Grizz, the Grizz on top of the power rankings. 
I think someone actually might have posted it in the group chat so you scratch your head. <laughs> You're thinking, really? I mean, I don't know how everyone else felt at the end of last year. Uh, I thought we got to where we got to. Yeah, some guys were injured, but we had guys that were hurting too. I mean, we had Chris Paul that couldn't shoot the basketball. Maybe someone wants to run that past Anthony Davis before he just, you know, um, dislocated a tear duct with being so salty today. But, um, you know, I, I evaluate at the end of the season and I, I'm a betting man, but I would have been very eager to bet up that we're going to get organic improvement from Cam Johnson to Mikael Bridges, right? And we have. And that's that's was going to be the thing that pushed us further along, you know. And, and it, leaps and bounds it, too. Address address the lack of size, which they did with Javel, and they brought Busy in there as well. You don't get to what are we fifty four and fourteen by accident, right? And it's not like we've been untouched with health. We we've missed key guys, and we've we've just found a way. The system stacks up. It's the next guy mentality. I'm so sick of, man, you know, I would have won Tuts Lotto if Jamal Murray was healthy, for God's sake. I mean, he's coming off an ACL. How do you know he's going to, how do you know he's going to be the player that he was? I mean, we're still waiting for his bloody New Balance stuff to come in, but I keep seeing his big head pop up there and he's talking about all of that stuff. <laughs> I do, I, you know, I subscribe to the fact he's always played well against Phoenix Murray. So I can understand from a Denver point of view, geez, if we had him, we would have given them a run. Absolutely. And that's fine. But, they might have I mean, actually won a single game, you know? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, we played them. Maybe. I think they, they won the season series against us last year. All the games were played pretty early, right? But there was one game he got away with a travel and that game went to overtime and they beat us. And then the two-minute report clearly said this was a travel should have been called. So, you know what? Some people like to take a little tidbit of information and, and run away with it. Yeah. But, no, nah, I mean, in terms of, you know... Guys could fall down tomorrow. Draymond Green might not make it back. For me, if he doesn't make it back, everything indicates that he will, right? But if he doesn't make it back, then that's probably curtains for Golden State. I don't think they can win the title without Draymond Green. Ja Morant might go down tomorrow, right? All these things can happen. It's a game. Um, did you see the? But- um, did you see that? Um, that that statistical uh, pick I shared in the chat um, earlier yesterday or the day oh, before? Oh, with the yeah, yeah, the, we're most, like the injured- most affected by injury, right? Fifth most team. Exactly. So, so basically, the size of that bubble uh, represented um, um, how much we were affected. I think um, value over replacement player um, with the amount of injuries, and then the height of the bubble was how many wins that they had. We were at top as far as um, wins, and our mm-hmm. bubble was probably the second or third biggest. So that that accounts for how many injuries that we've actually had, and 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 the magnitude of them injuries. So. Ultimately, um, um, we're in the top five, as in um, as far as the most affected by injuries goes, and we are um, have a record fucking lead on the entire league as far as wins go. Um, so yeah, one hundred percent right. And you know what? Um, fuck, that bubble's going to get bigger and bigger because Chris Paul still got a few weeks ago, and um, and but I just, I suppose the reason <laughs> the, the reason that I wanted this was it's just. Again, this, the fucking national media washes yep. over all this shit with us and just doesn't. Mm. Mate, doesn't um, compute. I'm not going to sorry, talk Nate, too much to. I'll go for it, mate. No, no, you. I'm going to wrap this up. So sorry. And I was just going to jump in as well. Just going back on the injury thing. The other thing that has happened as well. Injuries are one thing, but it's who gets injured and, and what time, right? We've had situations where we've been down to third stringers in center because we've had DA and we've had Javale out at the same time. And then we had CP3 out, we had Payne out, and then we had Holiday running the point. Then he had ankle soreness and couldn't go the next day. So all of a sudden, Alfred Payton has to dust off the cobwebs and comes in. The only guy that I've really seen from a national perspective that seems to buy into how deep we are is Richard Jefferson. He gave us a huge shout out, I think, when we played the Knicks there. And he probably got a little carried away by saying this team here, you know, that was running on the floor, so no CP, no book you know, would still be good enough to push for a seventh or eighth in the West. I mean, I'll leave that for other people to decide, but he's clearly impressed with what we do. So he's someone that's um, at least trying to tip the scales somewhat back to a, a somewhat of a balance. But yeah, I like listening it's... to him because not only is he funny and interesting and insightful, he's a homer. He's from Phoenix. He gives us credit. And it just I want to punch Reggie Miller every time he's calling one of our games. 
I hate him. And just to have, you know, Richard Jefferson out there talking the way he does about his sons, to your point, and building us up, when, boy, to your point, you've got people like Zach Lowe and uh, Bill Simmons literally just trying to create clickbait by talking us down. That's yeah, true. man. Um, Makes me Zach, Lowe, Zach Lowe used to be really good um, for the Suns, and he um, he was a big Devin Booker guy when, when, when a lot of the other pundits weren't, and um, he's just fucking lately, it's just like it's uh, he's just gone cold on us, so it pisses me off. Anyway, next one. Let's next move one. it along. All right, so that, that that's going to wrap up our discussion points uh, for the night. We've only got one segment left. It's the thumbs up, thumbs down segment, which I've already preambled. We're going to change up uh, just purely for, well, for two reasons. The first one was to upset Gav, because he's not here to do anything about it. Um, he took the liberty last week when me and Boyd were having a, a, a space out. Um, but also, it seems to have been getting to a point where we just want to call each other dickheads for the sake of it. So let's actually draw it back a little bit and have some interesting discussions where we actually look at each other's viewpoints. So we've got, we've got three points here. It's not going to be rapid fire. We'll talk through it. We'll give it some perspective. We'll give a thumbs up, thumbs down each, and then explain our position. And it may be, Boyd, that as we're talking about the points, yeah, you need to say, hey, you know what? I still don't get what you're talking about and explain it more. That's okay. We can. We can take the time. So let's do that. Uh, let's start with the first point here. Now, this point is based off Monty's post-game presser after today's game at the Lakers. He was talking about efficiency of the team, and he used one specific example to explain the efficiency, which was if you combine book and campaign's assists versus combined turnovers, it showed the efficiency of the backcourt. Um, I guess the statement is, should we as a pod actually start looking at efficiency as a, a topic rather than just player of the week and defensive player, look at efficiency and maybe look at the team assists versus turnovers each week to look at how efficient our week has been. Thumbs up and thumbs down as to whether it's something you think there'd be value in talking about each week. Trev? Thumbs up for me, but probably with an asterisk as well. I think efficiency is great, but if you're just looking at it in isolation, it doesn't give you the full story. I mean, if we had four games against the Lakers defense today, I'm going to expect our efficiency to be pretty good by virtue of the fact that there's hardly any pressure on the ball. Conversely, if I have four games like we did against Toronto that were running blitzes, doubles, pretty mm -hmm. hard, causing turnovers, just causing havoc with their length, yeah, that's going to be a bit more. So I think, yeah, there's definitely um, merit to investigating it for sure, but I think it does need to be paired with, you know, your opponents and, and what you're running. I think it's great to see, all right, well, we might have lost the game against Utah and we coughed it up, you know, down the stretch like Jay Crowder did, right? you probably want to focus on that later. Or if you're, you know, let's say Cam Payne had a, a shocker against, you know, Team X last time and we've got them this week. Let's see how he's, what adjustments he's made against their defensive uh, coverages and how he's gone from that. So that, that's my take anyway. Boyd, what's your take? Thumbs up or thumbs down on let's look at efficiency more closely each week? Or is that the question, or is it do that instead of doing player of the week, defensive player no, of the week? No, not in starter. Just should we start discussing efficiency oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on a weekly basis, uh, given up. that Monty is... Yep, thumbs Look, up. Thumbs up. And I don't, and, and not, because, um, not because of Monty. It's just that them um, looking at um, 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 effective field goal efficiency and looking at the trends player to player is um, something that we probably should be doing already. Um, we do... Um, um, and, and we can do it with the current format to a certain extent and just elaborate a little bit more on on why you think DA, like like today when I, I mentioned, I actually done some research and I went back and checked that, you know, DA is shooting 70% this week. He's um, averaging 13 boards. But um, also, also, um, also you, you, you're right, looking at the advanced stats a little bit, 100% we should. Um, but yeah, I think that we can mould it into what we're doing now. So it's just um, the fact that, I haven't got a really brilliant <laughs> basketball mind myself, so it's a bit bit tougher. But um, but yeah, you're right. It's something that, that we definitely should do more of. So I'm, I'm with you both. I'm, I'm, I'm thumbs up on this. Um, I thought it was really interesting the way that Monty looked at just the, the, the relationship between 
um, assists and turnovers. Um, you might remember, Boyd, I looked at um, trying to come up with a new method of picking Defensive Player of the Week, and I was looking at minutes and the plus-minus. So what's the impact of the player with more minutes spent on the court uh, that wasn't the highest scorer? And I was just, like, siphoning through ideas to try and find a different way to come up with a Defensive Player of the Week. And when I heard Monty talk about the combination of assists and turnovers as describing efficiency, I thought, well, geez, that's a really good way of looking at it. You know what? Yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, so um, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. Um, um, I had a look today back at. I was, I was like, we, we, we are always being raved on about about you know how many assists we have by the third quarter or the first quarter or whatever and whatnot. And I went through. I, I went through box score, the box score, um, on the Bleacher Report app, and you scroll down and you can see who won the assist game, who won the turnovers, all that shit, right? And we uh, we won, so I went back to the Toronto game. We won that as well, assist wise. Even even though we lost, we 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 out assisted the other team. I had to go back to January to find a game, the first game, the last game that we lost the assist column to, <laughs> and it was in that back to back with the Utah Jazz. The second game of the back to back was the last time that we were we were beaten in the assist category. And it's a it's all, I think that's a twenty one or twenty seven game um, streak of of beating our opponents um, in the assist column. That's um, um, that's a product of Monty's um, unselfish um, 0.5 pass the ball mm-hmm. system. It's um, it 100% is. The low turnovers are the fact that we've had up until the last couple of weeks, we've had Chris, Chris Paul being a fucking maestro in that category. Um, and it's starting to it's starting to flip a little bit now as far as turnovers go because we've got some other guys. But 100%, it's um, and I'm glad Monty's looking at it because um, because definitely that is how you win games. That's the um, if, if if you're not turning the ball over, mm-hmm. it's a game of possessions, right? So um, yeah, and 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 if you're getting everybody in rhythm by getting you know the pass rate and the assist rate up, that's that is the ultimate formula to win in basketball. It's interesting when you go and break down the games, though. So if you take Monty's theory of assists and turnovers and what that looks like together, Book and Cam had 21 assists and only two turnovers. Both of those were from Book. If you look at the entire team, the team had 36 assists and nine turnovers for the game. But when you compare that to the Lakers is where it gets really funny. The Lakers had 24 assists and 19 turnovers. So they almost had a turnover for every assist, which is null and void. It's, and if you just look at um, LeBron, LeBron had six assists but four turnovers. Yeah. So when you start comparing the the teams and the player stats next to each other, that's where I really found the value in the the word efficiency in all that. A couple of those we've got end of game shot clock turnovers too, right? Because it's done and dusted. We just dribble it out. So hey, yeah, hey, you're right. Trim you're it right. off a bit. So. All right, so we've got uh, two more points. The Bounce Back Suns is the next one we're going to talk about. The, um, no real context in this except that we spoke about it and everyone knows that we don't like to lose uh, a second game in a row and they play a lot harder and they usually come out and pull wins out when they're playing after a loss. So looking at what happened this week with uh, Toronto and then to LA, the Suns' trend of winning after a loss is a good thing. Now this is where it might be a little bit of very perspective on how you how you take that, because um, is the Suns' trend of winning after a loss a good thing? Back to you, Trev. Thumbs up for me. Uh, clearly, it is a, a good thing. Um, obviously, in the playoffs, a team to knock you out has to beat you four times. So if you, hopefully, you're going to hit first, and we get the first one on the board, and then you know that kind of takes care of it. I think it shows a great willingness to get back to work um you know and you can look at it there's ways that you lose the game right you can it's either off your to use a tennis parlance it's off your own racket or sometimes the opposition just get red hot um and can't miss and out shooting you from have a you know off the charts night from three and you have that right it comes and goes i think it's you know it's not something that worries me i think it's It'd be great if you could win every single game, but we know that's just not feasible, right? I mean, we had an 18 in a row. Well, Boyd doesn't believe that. 
Okay. <laughs> well, that's why we've got him on What's here. What's an 82-win season and sweep of playoffs and finals guy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, you can look at all of that and then you can throw in like their scheduling as well, you know, who you get on a back-to-back and also when you get teams, right? If they're who you're missing. All right. And it might be like we're missing DA against, you know, a, a team with a small front line. Okay, we can get away with that. All of a sudden, we're missing DA against uh, the Bucks or, or the Philly, Philly 76ers. All of a sudden, it's a, a different kettle of fish. So, I mean, all of those things come into it. I just like the fact that they, you know, get back on the horse, get after it. They know what they, what they do works. They just, it saves attention to details. And it's not like, not too often that we get blown out either, right? You know, even a game against Toronto where we wouldn't say we played well. And you credit Toronto for what they did. We were still in the game, actually hit the front after being, I think we got 20 down at one stage, roared all the way back um, and just couldn't finish off. So, no, nah, look, it's a, a good thing. Um, yeah, as long as we don't lose two in a row in the playoffs, I'm good. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> so, Boyd, Boyd, son's trend of winning after a loss is a good thing. Which way you are you going that one? Next night. Well, oh, me, yeah. I... I looked at it as a thumbs up because it's a confidence in that we don't win, we don't lose two in a row. And then I looked at the impact of that in the playoffs. And to your point, what you mentioned, Trev, as long as you win the first game in a playoff series, if you do not lose two games in a row, you win the series. So there's a confidence in that. Now, I'm not assuming that we're going to win one, lose one, win one, lose one, and so forth. But knowing that there's a confidence in we don't lose back-to-backs, uh, as long as you win that first one in a playoff series, that's why I think it's a good thing. Well said. Yeah, so look, my thing is is that I think... Um, well, yeah, it's a good thing that we, we, we always uh, win the game after a loss. I mean, um, you're not going to win every game, although I think we will. Um, <laughs> I'll... No, the facts are is that no one goes through a season 82-0. and 0, And if we were to uh, not adjust as well as what we do, you know, we're going to see more losing streaks and we're going to be a mid-tier team. So, yeah, 100%, man. You know, um, um, it's great that we always win the bounce-back game. And, um, look, we wouldn't be where we, we, we were if, if we didn't. So, yeah. Um, it's all, it's all a learning experience, I, I suppose. Um, we're adjusting to, to how teams beat us on any given night and we're, um, and we're, and we're fixing it for the very ne- next game. And you need that in a playoff setting. For everyone that might wonder why um, Boyd's um, vocals changed a little bit and the, the vision is dropping out, I, I do have to give Boyd some credit here. He may not remember when his kids' birthday are, but he does remember <laughs> when they finish work and he has to go pick them up. So, 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 so just quickly, and, 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 and sorry, guys. So, so my partner is um, putting the baby down to sleep, and um, my daughter is knocking off work. She works at the local McDonald's, and uh, oh, I don't want to leave her out uh, at night by herself. So, I am in the car right now driving. Good dad. Got, the good dad. <laughs> I've got well, connection, and I'm just going to pick her up. We'll wrap this up quick then, Boyd, because the last one of the thumbs up, thumbs down was yours, and I imagine you're going to have a pretty fiery um, uh, comment on it. Have the Suns already got their point guard of the future on the team? Let's start with you, Boyd, in case you uh, drop out picking your daughter up. No, I won't drop out again. We're good. Let's get into this. This is a this is a highly contentious subject, right? Because we've um, we've been forced into a position where we haven't had our Hall of Famer point guard and it's going to be for an extended period, right? We've also made an acquisition of, uh, of, of a young 21-year-old Aaron Holiday, which is a guy that we um, highly coveted in the, um, in the draft a couple of years ago. Um, and we have this guy from fucking China, Campaign, who at one point, was a um, was a um, end of the bench guy, and then he, he's 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 upgraded and um, became a um, you know a solid backup point guard. And now recently, we've seen him um, not just be a, a spark off the bench, a um, you know a quick a quick fire 10, 10 points to get the second unit going. He's become 
a distributor in the same mold as a CP3 with a little bit of a little bit of spunk about him. Now, I'm not saying he's anywhere near CP3, right? But like he's pulling games with um, you know eight to sixteen assists per game, and he's literally this is his second season with CP3. We're going to see another three with him learning under CP3, at which point he's going to be around about 30 years old by the time CP3 hangs up the boots or the sneakers, I should say. But here's the thing. Is there more improvement in campaign? And is he someone that's going to be able to take that place and be that floor general? No one's going to be as good as CP3, but is, is he... Is he that guy or is he just a stopgap, a bridge until what, you, you know, as the guys on, on the solar panel were saying today, is he just a bridge until Monty can find another uh, starting point guard? What are, you, what are your guys' thoughts? Trev, thumbs up or thumbs down, the Suns already have their point guard of the future. I imagine you believe it's Aaron Holiday. <laughs> uh, look, it's a, it's a thumbs up, but I think it's, it's a testament to the system, right? I think the the way the system has been set up is allowing campaign. He's identified how to play within that system. His role has changed a little bit now with CP3's injury, but he's really acquitted himself quite well, haven't been throwing the keys to the offense. Are there going to be better point guards out there? Potentially. I mean, it all kind of depends on can you coexist with your other other guys out there. I think that's the, the key aspect. You need your point guard to have um, really good relationships with the rest of your starters. So, I mean, for example, without a, a good point guard, DA's effectiveness would be the first one to drop, right? DA needs a, a good, competent point guard yeah. to make good entry passes into him. Uh, I think, and we saw once Ricky Rubio came over, right? Once we had a competent point guard at the helm, DA was able to get the ball in some more dangerous areas. And he thrived on that. And hence, we've kept going. So long story short, yeah, campaign can be the guy. Absolutely, I think he can. But, you know, who, who knows what else is going to be out there? And is the team still going to, are we still going to be moving in the same direction going forward? I certainly hope we are. Um, but yeah, I, you know, certainly he's got to be the best backup point guard out there, at least, you know, in the conversation. Absolutely. So be comfortable with what you've shown, just... particularly. Sorry. Um, just particularly since CP3 has gone out. Sorry, boy, what were we going to say? Contractually as well, this is um, here's the thing. We're we're in the in the we're in a little patch here where we're about to have to if we want to keep our core together. Your Cam Johnsons, your Devin Booker's, your um, DeAndre Aytons, your Mikael Bridges, they're all going to be earning. You know, well, Cam Johnson may earn 20, 20 million a year. Um, DA is going to get close to a max, if not a max. Who knows what's going to happen there? Do we, do we, can we, if we keep these guys together, can we afford another top notch uh, uh, point guard? Or is it going to be this guy that's already got the chemistry and, and is due to still improve year on year under the tutelage of uh, uh, CP3? Is he good enough for us to have championship aspirations in the future after CP3? retires and look and look and i suppose my my thing is is that i think um i think i think he could be that point guard of the future um he's not there yet but i think he could be given the flashes he's shown in the in the, in the time cp3 has been out well boy yeah. if we were going to go through rebuttals i'm going to jump in and say i'm thumbs down on this one not that i disagree on anything that you pair have said um but I, I've said on a previous pod when we talk about the same thing, I still believe that CP3 will introduce someone else that will become the next point guard of the future. Um, Do you I, think, I think that could be Holiday then? No, I know. I know. I believe somebody else will come through CP3's contacts as head of the Players Association, as being the veteran that he is, as being the influence that he is. Just like JaVale came in, I believe their next starting point guard for us is going to come the same way and that's just my opinion that's not to disagree with your what you think campaign is or the con contractual uh, fit that we need to keep the money that's already here in order to pay the rest of our guys you made a comment before about will we see any more improvement from campaign i don't think we do i think what we saw 
right at the moment, which is the best we've seen him play, is his peak. What I do think we'll see is more consistency. And I think, Trev, to your point, I think he is the perfect backup point guard for this team. He still has a lot more to learn from CP3. I just don't think at this point he's the leader that takes over that starting spot on the long-term basis. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's all fair points. Absolutely. I couldn't disagree with any of that. So, I mean, it's some parts of this, you know, this is what makes it fun, right? You do need that crystal ball. I mean, obviously you, you compare any point guard to Chris Paul, you're probably going to come off second best more often than not, right? Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> theoretically, you know, Cam steps in, but what we lose from transitioning from Chris Paul to campaign potentially can be offset by organic growth from Macau, from Cam, from DA, um, you know, someone else comes in there as well. Um, but, you know, it's all hard to say. Who knows what the market's going to happen? There's a fallout with a, a stud at some other team or an up-and-comer that James Jones quickly identifies. Opportunistic GM that we've in. got. So that's exactly <laughs> right. So, or some other guy buys himself out of contract from the Congo, <laughs> exactly. maybe. Who knows? He, comes, he comes over with Busy. So who would know? All right. Well, look, that, that wraps up a very different thumbs up, thumbs down for the week where nobody called anybody a dickhead and we all got to talk about our actual opinions. Right. I'm going to say thank you very much, Trev, for jumping in again. Uh, like we said, you had rave reviews last week. Everyone was saying, oh, yeah, they put him back on. So thanks again for taking the time, mate. Thanks again for giving us um, some very, very good perspective and a different, nah. different edge for the week. Absolutely. Pleasure, Nate. And look forward to uh, seeing the scenes from the GoPro uh, strapped to your head at the Chicago game at the, uh, <laughs> at the bar this week, Nate. Should be good yeah, viewing for all, I'd suggest. Different way of doing that, although at least we've got the microphone sorted. You might uh, have a Boyd... bit of editing to do on that one, mate, so good luck to you. <laughs> Boyd, I'm really impressed you didn't crash your car going to pick your daughter up. Um, anyone watching the YouTube footy footage probably got a little dose of epilepsy from what was happening with your camera there, but uh, <laughs> we appreciate your commitment no, to, a... to sticking around. No, that's all good, my man. Um, and is um is is Gav gonna fucking um see this as a mutiny, uh, Nate? Is he gonna see it as a mutiny as you are uh, overthrowing his podcast? And not really. His, uh... He knows I don't uh, want to do as much work as uh, I, I do too much as it is already. <laughs> I don't want to take on any more. No chance. <laughs> This is a, it's, it's good that we do this for our group and, and like you've jumped up, Ash has jumped on in the past. We've had everyone willing to say, you know what, I'm, I'm happy to jump on and have my say. And eventually, you know, Gav will step down, I'll step down, Boyd will offend someone and get kicked off of all online platforms altogether for his language and other people will need to step up. And so who knows? We'll who get Zach Lowe to run things and we'll be there loving all right. Um, what do we always say there, Boyd? Like, subscribe, tell a friend. Don't tell your mum because she's not going to like what we talk about. Um, the American listeners, we do this for Aussies. So if you're still listening, still watching, thank you because you usually offend you by now. Um, I know Gav has uh, got many more guest speakers lined up from the American crew. So well done, Gav. And uh, there's always more coming your way, Aussie Suns fans. Thank you very much for listening, watching, and... We'll catch you again soon. Pleasure, guys. Guess See you, guys. What's up, Aussie Suns fans? This is, I would say, top three podcast out there. The Aussie Suns fan podcast. I, this is terrible. I'm sorry. What's the... <laughs> Oh, Dave. Dot, <laughs> dot, dot. Hey, this is Dave King from Brightside and the Solar Panel. I want to give a special shout out to your Aussie Facebook group for Suns fans. Good job. Keep up, keep up all the hard work, and we'll see you on the Solar Panel when you guys watch again. Was that good? It's going to be a good time. <laughs>